The problem is that they sort of appeal to, to a, a person's lazier instincts. To a certain extent, you have to look in yourself and say like, what kind of person am I? Oh, no kidding. <laughs> Wow, where did you pick that guy up? That's wild. I just wouldn't want to be involved in anything like that, either deliberately or accidentally. Oh, I have a question, Richard, which has been- Yeah, sure. I've been mulling over since I found your channel. Why is it called The Plain Bagel? Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Richard Coffin. You're watching The Plain Bagel. Welcome to the first ever uh, Plain Bagel podcast interview, something like that. This is a, <laughs> a new series that I'm hoping to, to put out more regularly. Uh, where we talk to other YouTubers, other professionals, and uh, people with unique investing experiences uh, with the goal of demystifying the investment process, both from the uh, perspective of the industry, but also just from the everyday Joe, the people who are looking to invest their finances and are curious how it works and, and would like to see and hear from people firsthand uh, what that process looks like. And who better to kick off the series than Mr. Patrick Boyle. Patrick Boyle runs his own YouTube channel and is a ex-hedge fund manager as well as a professor of finance. Patrick, thank you for joining me today and for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks for having me on. For those who might not be familiar with you, uh, why don't we start with you kind of just explaining what you post on YouTube, the kind of content that you have on the platform. Sure, well, I've had a YouTube channel, I guess for about two years now. Um, originally, it started out as really just being something for my, my students. Like I, I teach financial derivatives, so I put up a lot of financial derivatives content to begin with, just right. kind of to help people uh, revise and that kind of thing. And then as the pandemic kicked in, I guess about a year and a half ago, uh, suddenly I started getting more of an outside audience. And I really initially was very much kind of classroom content, and then it moved into just sort of interesting things from the world of finance, like trying to understand the details of how markets work, why people do what they do, and maybe even a lot of the sort of counterintuitive things that, that happen in markets that, uh, that cause you to, to question what's going on. Yeah, my, my experience going through your own videos uh, is that you tend to cover more niche topics or things that are more, in some cases, more advanced. You do cover, you know, basic things. But uh, one thing I, I really like about your content is you seem to cover things truly from a professional standpoint, information that, you know, is a bit harder to find online. You know, I think in the YouTube space, it's very easy to find personal finance tips and things like that. And certainly there's a space for that. Uh, but you have the background to know, uh, you know, how these strange anomalies can happen in the market and these things that, you know, if you ask the everyday Joe, they might not understand off the top of their head, you know, uh, something we were discussing earlier, why oil futures can go negative, for example, things like that, that aren't just as widely known um, about the market. So, and, and I think you're over 100,000 subscribers now, is that? Yeah, yeah. With the pandemic, I, I think, uh, we're again we, we had a quick chat uh, before starting this but uh definitely seems to have brought a lot of interest to the investing space so yeah well i guess it's sort of interesting when markets go up people get very excited about markets and uh you know i don't know there's always this ebb and flow in the business i i started out my career in the late 1990s you know for the kind no of kidding. right before the dot-com boom and so right in many ways like there was there was just so much excitement back then like anytime you went out all anyone wanted to talk about was stocks and in a funny way i see that with things like cryptocurrencies today and uh, you know it's just uh and there, there's these ebbs and flows where things get you know draw a lot of attention and then the, the, it sort of dampens down but you're kind of saying that you see parallels between the two. Would you say that things are better this time around, worse than the dot-com crash? Like, how would you compare kind of the, the hype, I guess, that we're seeing out there to what you might have seen leading up to the dot-com crash? Well, they're, they're very different. And in, in true things were much bubblier uh, with the dot-com uh, bubble and bu bust and boom. Um, it, it was a very interesting time because markets were very interesting back then in that 
you know, this new technology appeared and it was very obvious to everyone. Like you, you looked at the way the internet worked and the pace at which it was improving. And it was very obvious that it would become a big thing and that a, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of shopping and all that sort of thing, brokerage and so on would move to the internet. That was definitely right. obvious. Um, so people were right about their prediction about what would happen. But then maybe they got over excited about many of the companies that they thought would succeed. Um, and, and so, you know, in many ways, I mean, I, I, it's, it's always annoying, like people always want to kind of say this is exactly like and they name another market period. And, you know, they're always different. Like that's, that's why markets are interesting. It's not just the same old story repeating itself. But um, there are parallels in the in that there's a, a very excited kind of young audience for many, many of these uh, kind of, well, we'll say the meme stocks and the, the cryptocurrencies and things like that. They're drawing in a group of people kind of like, you know, I would have been 20 years old in the late 90s and felt I knew so much about uh, dot com stocks and like what was happening and old people were like, isn't this a fad? And you're like, it's not, it's really not, you know, and I, I guess right. young people today are possibly in some of those areas of the market feeling very similarly. Yeah. And, and I mean, you could definitely, you know, put the parallel between the internet and, and cryptocurrencies, you know, a lot of people see cryptocurrencies as being the future. And, and there are some people who probably argue the same thing that, you know, people don't understand and, and the technology and, and perhaps are a bit more pessimistic than they should be. Uh, but at the same time, just like in the dot com crash, you know, it, it, the question mark comes with which companies <laughs> and in and, and today's market, which cryptocurrencies are going to be the ones that end up reaping that reward. You know, the technology... well, well, that's even the thing. Like, we'll say if you look at some of the doc, like everyone's able to now look back and say, you know, oh, wouldn't you have loved to have bought Amazon in 1997 or something like that? And of course, that would be great. But had you bought a basket of internet companies in 1997, you know, you would have looked like a genius for a couple of years and utter idiot for the next 10. And it's sure. really only a yeah. year or two ago that I forget how long ago when the Nasdaq sort of surpassed its level in, in um, that it had reached in late 1999. So it's not, it, it, there, there's more involved in it than sort of saying, like knowing that something will be big doesn't mean that you'll make money out of it. Right. That, yeah, that's an interesting point about the basket of, of internet uh, stocks because, it, you know, it's like saying, well, you know, if you, sure, you might have picked Amazon, but maybe you picked uh, pets.com when, you, yeah. uh, when you're going through your .com picks. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting time and, and I'll be curious to see, especially with, uh, I feel like in the crypto space, especially scams and, oh, no kidding. <laughs> Wow, where did you pick that guy up? You know, That's this wild. is a vintage 1999 uh, Pets.com puppet uh, that, no that I bought on, on eBay, you know. <laughs> wow, so you're getting in the uh, in the collection space now, yeah. too. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? That might be more valuable than the stock in a few years. <laughs> um, so you would describe yourself as a, as a quant manager, is, yeah. is that right? So, so maybe for people who aren't totally familiar with what that means, could you explain what quant investment management is and, and what that style of investing looks like. Sure. Well, the whole idea is essentially just to look at market data and kind of work out what works in markets. So instead of, we'll say, for example, like a valuation based investor would build a model that sort of looks at various, you know, how expensive is this stock versus another? While the, the quant end of things is much more just to try and back out of market behavior, what happens. And it's often even ties in a little bit with ideas from behavioral finance, but you're just looking for, uh, you know, you, it, it's the idea is just to test things in markets. And so, you know, you can test anything. Like if you will say, for example, if you think that you should invest in cheap stocks, you, you can then just take the S&P 500, get, you know, 20 years of data and see whether low PE stocks outperform high PE stocks that sort of a, a, a quantitative approach to the markets. Really, it's just all about trying to understand 
what moves markets, why they move. But, but on top of that, one of the things I think that's very interesting about being a quant investor or, and even just being a short-term trader is that you get to, to understand really how things change. Because a lot of people feel when they look at markets that they're sort of a key, you know, that someone could tell them something about markets. And once they know that, they could just sort of, you know, sit on a beach and make money while, while they just do the same thing over and over again. And what you learn is that is that markets just change constantly. And so you're always forced to do new research because as the stuff that you you know learned 10 years ago sort of works its way out into into public knowledge it stops working and you have to find something new so there's sort of always you find as a quant trader that you spend 90% of your time on research not on uh, you know order execution is you know the the smallest part of what you do Right. And, and I think that's an important point for anyone who might see uh, <laughs> those ads on online or, or anywhere uh, where people like to sell their trading robots and, and things like that. Uh, programs that, you know, they argue will make you large returns. Uh, but you hit on a good point that uh, the markets are ever changing and, and it's very hard to find a long term quantitative relationship that exists in a strong enough fashion that you can earn excessive return over time. Well, um, it, it's very interesting because it, it's almost a, an interesting thing about um, a lot of the short term trading ideas is that they you, you can often read sort of uh, like gambling books and that sort of thing. And, and those guys have worked out all this type of stuff many years ago. And there, right. there's a great book. It's actually Vic Niederhofer got me to read it years ago um, called The Secrets of Professional Turf Betting. And it's all about um, it's written by a guy about, you know, how to win at the racetrack kind of thing. But he explains that if you come up with a winning system, we'll say if it's something simple, like the heaviest horse always wins, right? What will right. happen is that over time, people will notice that the heavy horse always wins and everyone will bet on that. So the cost of those bets goes up and the win goes down or win stays the same, but the cost of the bet goes up. And so you suddenly turn a winner into a loser. And that, of course, happens in markets as well, where like any simple system gets noticed and then stops working. And so you're always scrambling for new things. And it, and it has to be that way, because otherwise someone would just discover a tiny little thing and, you know, make all of the money in the world. It can't work that way. Right. Yeah. I suppose there's always a point at which a profitable strategy uh, sort of ruins it for everyone else <laughs> Yeah. looking to, to do the same thing. Um, so would you say that, I, I guess, quant investing, it, it must lend itself to shorter term trading then. Is that how you it, see it? It tends to just because you can find more of that. And it's even just if, if you think if you're looking for sort of statistically significant trades, you need something with at least 30 observations, right? And so if you're looking right. at, you've kind of got best case scenario about 100 years worth of good stock market data. So if you're looking for trades that will work for a five year period, you know, with non overlapping periods, you, you're not going to get very many observations. So you tend to find shorter term things that sort of will have the kind of win rate and statistical significance that you want. But of course, then you run into all sorts of other problems. You have much more uh, money spent on trading, on taxes, all, all sorts of other things. And you require maybe more infrastructure to sort of get the types of fills that you want uh, compared to a long term investor. Do you think uh, people trading for themselves have the resources to do that style of, of trading outside of something like a hedge fund to do it, you know, on not, I'm not necessarily speaking about on, on a Robinhood app, but you know, I think a lot of people are interested in things like day trading. Do you think it's, it's feasible for people who don't have act, you know, you mentioned the costs and, and the time of research. Uh, what's the minimum amount of dedication, I guess, that someone needs to do that? I think that you'll find yourself working very hard doing that. Like it is totally possible. And, and I know a lot of people, I mean, now I no longer run a fund, but I run my trading strategy. So I do the same thing I always did, but just without outside investors. Right. But 
The thing is that it, it does take up a lot of your time. Um, but usually if you're the kind of person who enjoys it, it's not that it's not that bad. The the thing I don't like about a lot of the sort of, I don't know, the sort of fake gurus that you see on the internet selling systems. The problem right. is that they sort of appeal to, to a, a person's lazier instincts where they kind of tell you, you know, you can buy, uh, you know, uh, uh, buy a stock after it's gone down and it'll go up and you'll make money. And they, they try and act like they just need to tell you one secret and you're, you're done. If you look at all of the great investors out there, like, you know, name them, they're, they're not hanging out on yachts and, uh, you know, d doing the, you know, at parties the whole time, like Ty Lopez, you know, they're, they're doing real things. They're in an office. They've got a team of people. They're grinding out hard research. They're paying for expensive data and they're doing a lot. Like it's very active and you're, you're even just on the phone with brokers and salespeople. You're trying to bring down your cost of trading. You're trying to improve your IT infrastructure. It's a full-time job. Like it, it pays well once you get it to work, but it's not something that you can sort of do in the evenings and weekends and expect uh, th that it'll it'll uh, provide immeasurable wealth. You know? Right. Well, I, certainly you touched on it. Those programs definitely appeal. Uh, you know, it's it's called get rich quick for a reason, but it's it's appealing to people who don't have that educational background. Like I, you know, you, you look at your own career path and, and the, your own education that you have. Uh, which I believe you have a, a master's if, in finance. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you look at that and, and the time you spent and, and, you know, sure, you could say that Patrick Boyle is able to do it. But uh, <laughs> the odd thing is that you also put in the time for it. I just have the interest in it, you know, and that's something sure, that yeah. you can you know, it's kind of like if you watch like a great musician, for example, who, who, who plays like the violin, like nothing you've ever heard, right. you know, can anyone do that? I would say maybe they can, but, but not without an awful lot of effort. And maybe you're only willing to make that effort because you're sort of drawn to it. And for some, one reason or another, I was kind of drawn to markets. Like I just, when I learned about them, I found it so fascinating. And I, I just really wanted to put time into it. And I really, I didn't view it as work. I, I was just satisfying my curiosity. And I think, you know, I have friends who are great musicians and that sort of thing. I have a, a friend who's actually, he's an economist, but a phenomenal guitarist. And he talks about being a teenager and that his parents couldn't get him to put down his guitar. Like he was driving them nuts. Like he wouldn't put it down. He played it all day, all night. Right. And that's how he got good. And there's not really a shortcut to that. Yeah. And, and if you're someone who has a full-time job doing this sort of work, I think most of your time is going to be spent doing that work because you're passionate about it and, and because you enjoy yeah. it. Um, and, and it's not something, and you know, it's okay that most of us aren't meant to, <laughs> to be day traders. I, I even think when people choose an investment style, like I, you know, obviously it makes sense to choose a, an investment style that might have some evidence of having worked for other people in the past. But I sometimes think, well, say for example, if you look at famous investors out there with really different styles, like you've got say Jim Simons, a, a quant trader, we've got, um, uh, you know, Kathy Wood, a growth investor, Warren Buffett, a value investor. There's not an awful lot of overlap in what they do. But but could one do the other thing? Probably not, because I think also you're you're slightly drawn to it. Like, you know, you're, you're not going to the type of person who is a value investor is always looking for like a, a sort of a cheap way of getting something good, you know, right. and the type of person who's a growth investor is always looking for the cool new thing. And you know, to a certain extent, you have to look in yourself and say, like, what kind of person am I? And is there an investment style that relates to that? Because if you if you took Warren Buffett and told him, you know, find all the hottest new technologies out there. I mean, God knows what he'd come to you with. You know, it'd be like, well, this company makes bricks, but really, well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah. you kind of have to also, uh, I don't know, like your your personality will matter when it uh, when you're searching because because certain people would love doing what I do. Most people would find it awfully tedious. Right. And, and, you know, it's funny too, because I think a lot of people, uh, my view has always been that there's room for multiple styles of investing. And in fact, there has to be, uh, really, because you can't have one dominant school of, of investing 
to dominate the market because just like you mentioned earlier, the arbitrage and, and the evening out of, of returns will just make that negligible. Well, it, um, it would become so obvious that, yeah. that everyone would do it and then it couldn't work. Right, makes sense. Um, I, I wanted to talk quickly about, uh, we discussed it briefly, but kind of this retail investor boom that we've seen uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and partially because uh, as a ex hedge fund manager, I was curious on, on YouTube, did you see any uh, kind of negative response uh, during the whole GameStop fiasco? A lot of that attention was uh, investors sort of uh, grilling hedge funds and, and short sellers particularly uh, for their practices. Did you, were you on the receiving end of any of that? <laughs> you know, I probably got a few angry comments. Amusingly, I, I sort of stopped reading a lot of the comments. Like I'll read the comments when a new video goes out, but after a while I, I decided not to just because I don't really enjoy, especially when people get a bit heated and whatever. So I just right. let the comments largely do their own thing. Um, you know, it's funny because I think when people watch my videos, they're able to work out like I think they feel this sort of evil people in a club who, um, you know, they're ganging up and trying to take money away from regular people. And the truth is that most hedge fund managers are trying to make, take money away from other hedge fund managers. Like, I, I you know, I, they've no right. interest in like kind of someone with their $500 in a Robinhood account. It, it's not, I don't know, I, I, I think that people presumed an awful lot of malice. Like even there was, um, you know, that guy who lost an awful lot of money, uh, Melvin Capital. Right, and yeah. You know, there was a there's a lot of real anger about that guy. And I, I don't know, I just saw it as a guy who, you know, kind of put on probably some trades that made sense to him. It went horribly, horribly wrong. And he, you know, essentially is losing his business and whatever. And so I look at it and I don't kind of go like it serves him right for, you know, not caring about video game retail, you know, like because also I think there's this idea that you can kind of bang a stock down to zero. Now, the problem with that is, well, say if you did do that, if you sold so much of a stock that it went to zero, then you need to cover and you need to buy it back and it's going to go straight up, you know? And so you, you kind of can't do that. Like in the way that a small trader can't do that, a big trader can't either. And actually, as a big trader, it's more difficult because you have more market impact and your goal is always to have as little, like the way you can make money is by X executing trades that don't move the market. Whenever you're moving the market, that's a cost to you because it's, you know, if you if you are crossing the spread every time to trade, yes, the price will be moving down, but you're getting the bad fills in that. It doesn't work mm. for you. It's not a way of making money. Um, so I, I think there was maybe a certain misplaced anger there. Um, I, I even think there's kind of an interesting thing where I p think a lot of people misunderstood even how markets work because a lot of people seem to feel that a company if the stock price is low that it goes bankrupt but of course if you think about it a company issues stock to the public right and at the ipo money comes into the company ownership of shares goes out to the public at that point to a certain extent, unless you need to raise more capital, which you only need to do if things are going wrong for your company or if you have a big expansion idea, mm -hmm. in truth, the stock price shouldn't matter that much, you know? So it's quite reasonable. Like if Amazon.com, which was generating great profits and whatever else, if the stock price went to zero, Amazon doesn't go bust, you know, they keep selling stuff and making money. And it's a great opportunity for someone to buy a business with great cash flows at a discount, you know. So I think a lot of people who were new to markets thought that, you know, that how a company goes bankrupt is that the stock price goes to zero. Well, usually it's kind of debt that will put you bankrupt, right? In that, right. In that you yeah. owe, ca in their required cash flows that you can't uh, make, you can't provide, so. In many cases, if the share price was impacting the company, it would almost be a company you don't really want a whole lot of exposure to because really, you know, if a company's failing and they're issuing stocks to survive, it's kind of a last 
ditch effort to, to stay afloat. And then that's probably a bad sign for the investors who are who are buying those shares. And, and also that's why the, the price is low, is that it's sort of it's a business that's not booming, you know, like it's, uh, you know, the, you know, if you have a, an amazing huge, it's kind of always the problem of capital markets in that kind of the more you need money, the less people want to give it to you, right. you know, yeah. because when, when things are booming, everyone can see they're booming and you don't need other people's capital. Yeah. And and uh, on, on kind of that note, too, I think a lot of companies would actually love to see their their stock price decline, at least temporarily. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, concentrate their their share owners by buying back some shares that's a very popular yeah well that that's actually even an interesting thing just with markets is that in many ways like as a as an individual investor a bit of volatility isn't bad for you like that's how you get to sort of outperform the market is we'll say if there's a dip and a rally you get to buy the dip you know while if the market went up in a very smooth manner you would only ever get the returns of the market. It's when it's when sort of surprising and unusual things happen and you get to make a wise decision when other people are making unwise decisions. That's how you outperform. Right, really good points. One thing I want to point out too about uh, GameStop that it's kind of interesting because it's, it's true what you say that once a company has issued their shares, it doesn't really matter what the stock does. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, specifically with GameStop, they did take advantage of, of that second share issuance um, once the price was high. So it's kind of a weird situation where GameStop specifically in that situation took advantage of the, the higher stock price to issue shares and possibly save their business. And it's kind of a weird, one of the rare examples of stock investors possibly impacting the future of a business you know i think if you looked at gamestop's yeah. financials leading up to that whole jump um the company was you know losing money annually to, uh, in terms of profits uh but if you get a sudden injection of, of capital from such a high share issuance well, you know, if you could just buy another business and keep going as something well, else. It's, it's a huge opportunity yeah. right like it's a very different business today than it was we'll say a year ago simply because you've we'll say if you are a shaky business it means that you've got a cash flow problem if your stock price goes so high that you can issue shares and bring in a ton of money you don't have a cash flow problem anymore right. so a very high share price actually is an amazing opportunity and if you look at tesla tesla is a good example of this where the you know, the business was quite shaky for quite a while, but Elon Musk is a, a great talker, a great salesman, and he was able to just sort of talk the stock up, bring in capital, deploy that capital, and, you know, the stock price would go up, he, he, he'd issue more shares, bring in more capital, and in a funny way... You know, as long as you're able to do that, uh, you know, the, the business suddenly becomes quite sustainable because you've got a huge amount of kind of cheap capital that then if you deploy it in any sort of a sensible way, you've actually got a good business. Well, there, there could be someone else who might have a better technology, but if they can't sell it and can't bring in the money, they can never develop it. So, yeah. And uh, like with Tesla specifically, I think. I'd be very cautious to say that I would believe Tesla would, you know, run out of business in the near future because even their cash bonds, I think just on their balance sheet, they have something like $20 billion in cash. And that's money from investors that investors have willingly given this company. Uh, and, you know, it, it would be very difficult to see that company going bankrupt when you have this stockpile of money on hand. Uh, so, you know, whether they will do well in the future, only time will tell. But certainly when it comes to going out of business, you know, spending all that mm. money and blowing it all, uh, it, it certainly helps to have that that buffer. But um, but nonetheless, you know, it, it's to say that uh, stock price can impact a company's future, but certainly on a day to day basis, it doesn't matter if it, if it goes down. And No, you know, I, well, even if you think about it, that's why. Um, you know, that's why management are often paid in stock and so on, because in truth, you know, if you go back in the sort of 60s and 70s, when most sort of senior management, like CEOs at companies were just paid a, a sort of flat wage and a bit of a bonus, they largely didn't care about the stock price. They, they cared about just getting that annual pay. 
then you know you you sort of drown them in stock options and they suddenly start to care they maybe care too much and try and pump it up you know in, in, the, yeah, right before the, the options vesting but if you think about it like something had to be done to make management care about the stock price because otherwise they were sort of happy to be given a company to run and they could sort of you know get themselves a limousine driver and private jets and you know sure. not care about the the person whose money that they were uh, you know yeah. using to run the business and and so long as they keep the uh the business alive they they keep that gravy train going <laughs> yeah so so yeah it's a good point i i think one thing about the whole gamestop thing was a lot of people sort of pushed the narrative and whether true or not, but a lot of people were discussing the conversation was about short sellers marketing against the business. You know, it wasn't just that they had bet against the business, which some people had a big issue with, but you know, in many ways short selling is, is an important part of the markets. But um, outside of that, I think a lot of people were angry about the narratives that some of these companies, you know, the fact that they would go on news stations and, and talk about, uh, you know, GameStop, was a dying business and you know the sort of malicious intent behind that but really you know not to say that that's a good practice and certainly that does happen you know it's it's certainly a practice that's done but i think you see that on both ends well i mean you you turn on cnbc and it's all people talking their books like if they're if sure. they're saying a stock is great they probably own it <laughs> yeah and, and well that's it and it's it's the exact same issue on, on both ends you know and it's probably just as despicable to to do the same thing about a business you know say you don't truly believe it's going to do well but you go on air and you talk about how great the business is anyway it's no better in in my opinion anyway well it's funny because there's just more people on your side if you right. will say if you made up a lie like a pump and dump type thing sure you know it's not it, like you'll notice the sec does go after short sellers much more than than they go after uh, people who spread false positive stories and it's simply right. because it sort of seems more objectionable and you know and equally like you know it's not right to sort of harm a business or anything like that of course but there is a funny thing where no one gets too upset if someone like kind of says great things. Like if you say that you think that in five years time, uh, every car sold will be a Tesla, you know, do people can kind of go, well, that seems like a bit of a silly prediction, but all right. While if you went out and said that, you know, you, you think they won't sell a single car because their self-driving doesn't work, you're, you're a monster. And it's like, well, both are kind of on the same scale of, uh, you know, sort of, talking your position but i yeah it's, it is an interesting thing i i was a bit surprised like you and tom nash i guess were both approached by someone to try and pump a particular or review a stock and i thought yeah that was kind well of i got two emails story. one was to one was to review one was to actually promote but i think you know when you talk about the finance youtube space i think that's something a lot of financial youtubers i shouldn't say a lot of them some financial youtubers you know i don't want to make a blanket statement about all the youtubers out there especially when i know there are some really good ones out there uh, such as yourself but uh when it comes to the area um i don't i think a lot of people don't really recognize the influence they have people just talk about their own positions very uh you know flippantly in the sense of you know oh i love this company like and to some degree, that's fine, but you know, you do have that influence. If you say, as a YouTuber with, let's say, over a hundred thousand subscribers, if you say, "I love this company," people will buy yeah. it. Yeah. Like I, I think some people discount that. I, I am fairly confident. No, I believe they will, and I, I don't like that mm -hmm. because I wouldn't want to be responsible for that. There's a very valid argument that you could, even if you didn't plan on doing this, it's, it could even be an accidental pump and dump. Like we'll say, you know, and there's fund managers have been accused of that like of sort of being on cnbc and saying this is the best stock ever meanwhile their trading desk is back dumping the stock into the the cnbc buyers and you know i just wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be involved in anything no, like course. that either deliberately or accidentally like it's just it's even it's not my interest in the market like i think my interest in the market is about like i like discovering and learning and coming up with stuff and i don't really like i'm not in it for the cheat codes you know what i mean yeah yeah you like the game you don't want to cheat your way to victory but uh outside of that i kind of want to add two opportunities for tips that you might provide viewers both in terms of uh, what would be 
your advice for someone interested in getting into the hedge fund space or you know even you know pursuing professional a professional finance career but also on the personal investing side what would be some some tips you have for people uh, you know you mentioned not being emotional and things like that uh, do you have any tips on that side as well? Uh, sort of a two-pronged question for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for regular people and their investments, the truth is that they're often better off, like often you earn more money at work than you do doing anything else. So you're probably better off focusing on if you're really good at your job, you'll get paid more and you can save more. And often I think for a lot of people, like the problem with their, we'll say, retirement accounts and things like that, often relates to not saving enough money rather than not getting a high enough return on the money that they save. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of research, we'll say even on, uh, you know, asset allocation and things like that, that sort of the, the stock bond mix that you pick will have more of an effect on your overall returns than the specific stocks or specific bonds that you pick. And so it's once you understand that you can kind of move towards better decision making and maybe, you know, it's all about just focusing your efforts on the areas that will move the needle the most for you. So if you're putting a ton, a ton of time into something that's only going to add like a, a tick in performance to you in a year, it's not necessarily wise because that time could be deployed in your life for sort of more uh, beneficial outcomes, I would say. And I think I think that goes back to what you were saying, too, about how, you know, for some people, investing is, is a calling, if you will. But, you know, it's OK if, if that's not what you're passionate about. And, and, you know, if you're passionate about home renovations or, or yeah. whatever or, or whatever your field is that you have expertise in. Uh, you know, I think that's a good point. And what about on the on the professional side? You know, if you have someone who's interested in, in working in the finance area, uh, what would be kind of some some pointers based on your own experience? When people ask me sort of how to get a hedge fund type role, I my idea really is I, I think that they should just work out how to do something that's useful, you know, because a lot of people, in fact, it's sort of there's maybe a bit of a false narrative out there that sort of implies that people get lifted up by other people and they, they, the idea is like how do you get chosen and I would argue that people don't really choose you to improve your life they bring you in to improve their life and I would just say that if you want to work really in any field just work out how you can add value you know if you if you're going to start a job if you think when you interview someone if one person comes in and they say I really want to work here because I'll learn all about what you do and I'll get to do it myself and if someone else comes in and they say well I'd like to really just help you do your job better. You know, I can add value here. I'm good at Excel. I'm good at research. I'm, uh, you know, hardworking and, and I can add value to you. You kind of think, well, one guy wanted something from me, like mm -hmm. that I had to improve this person's life. And the other person said that they would turn up and make my world easier. This is a little bit more of an attractive proposition. And so I kind of think that if you really want to like be a trader or, you know, um, work for an active investment firm, I think that you should research and then you can turn up to interviews and pitch your research. And that's what always worked for me was because if you turn up to a job interview, we'll say, and you and some and you're sort of discussing your CV and your qualifications, the truth is it isn't necessarily going that well for you because you're having the same interview that everyone else has. Well, if you turn up and you say, I have an investment idea for you and suddenly you find yourself in this interview and instead of discussing sort of where you went to university and, uh, you know, things like that, you're saying, well, I think if we, if you were to invest in this basket of stocks, you would do this, it would happen this way. And, and here's a DCF model I built, or here's a quant model that I built, or whatever it is, you suddenly find yourself discussing the merits of your model or your approach to investing, which is what you might be hired to do. And so to a lot of my students, I tell them, like, if you want to work in corporate finance, you need to build a good merger model and turn up to, like, when you apply 
apply to job interviews. Like you tell them, I've built this model, it's a good model, let me explain it to you. If you want to be a trader, build a short-term trading model. You know, uh, like work out like an arbitrage model uh, and, and come and explain that to someone. They may never get you to trade the model that you turned up with. They may not even think it's a good model, but they'll know that you're the kind of person who can do this sort of thing and that that might be useful. Yeah, I, I think even if your model doesn't work or if it's blatantly wrong, I, I think you'll still have an advantage over people who didn't do anything or didn't come with anything yeah. prepared. Yeah. I always, I actually, uh, I used to go to a lot of uh, stuff at my university after I, I got my position to do something similar, like talk to people about, you know, how do you get into the, the finance career? Because it's unfortunate that in finance, uh, a lot of the jobs are, are bank sales positions, if you will. Uh, it's it's hard to get into the fund and the you know investment management side of things, but yeah. uh, the thing I would always tell people is is that you know show up with something you know whether it be a research report yeah. even if it's wrong even if you made mistakes it'll just at the very least show some ambition and that you have your mindset in the right place. Well, and even you're discussing things and showing how your mind works and you're showing a, a thought process which is so different than sitting there and discussing that you played hockey on the school team or you know whatever else. That, yeah. Like if you're discussing your CV, it's not necessarily going that well. Right. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to talk with us today and uh, for going over your career, your channel, and, and all the, uh, the tips you have for investing and, and uh, on the hedge fund side of things. Oh, I have a question, Richard, which has been, yeah, sure. I've been mulling over since I found your channel. Why is it called The Plain Bagel? It's, uh, so it's funny enough, it's, it's from university. Um, I had this professor and he had this kind of habit of just making up sayings like every few minutes of his lecture he would have an idiom that completely made up or something and one of the things he said was if you can't afford the cream cheese get the plain bagel and it was like a a uh, financial prudence like or frugality kind of statement it was about mm. you know how people overspend on stuff and I didn't think anything of it at the time but when I was thinking of a YouTube channel name I didn't want to do like you know, finance king or, or finance education or whatever. Like I didn't want it to be too literal. My thought was, mm. you know, if you make something that kind of stands out, eventually people will associate it with the topic you're discussing. Like it doesn't yeah. matter if your name was rainbow monkey or something like people will eventually be like, Oh, like, uh, that is the finance channel. Yeah. So, so it just kind of stuck to my mind. And I thought, you know, even though it's not a common, you know, saying or an idiom by any means. Yeah, it, it's sort of you know, sort of in my eyes represented financial frugality to some degree. Um, yeah. So. But then eventually people just turn it into a donut. So there's a guy. It's called Donut Something. He has this great channel. Um, I know what you're talking about. It's like half donut, one donut finance or something. Something like that. It's funny. That's actually so. That's how I how I found you was uh, through that video. Um, and uh, you know, I watch Coffeezilla and. and uh, you mentioned me at the end. I was, I was first of all, I was honored to be mentioned as a reliable YouTube channel. It's that's one of the best compliments you can get <laughs> in the education space. Yeah. But crazy to think, I think that was a year ago, almost exactly. It was. It was just about a year ago. Yeah, I think it was last August. And well, it's funny because. I hadn't prepared for that question and he asked me and all I could remember was the logo. <laughs> Something you know? round and, so I was like, bread I was like there's this guy and he's got the cartoons. That's funny. <laughs> oh, well, I'm honored. Thank you. That's, that's, that's funny. Uh, that, <laughs> that would be, again, I'm honored that that's the image that, that comes to mind when, when you're on the mm. spot thinking about finance. Guys, make sure to check out uh, Patrick on YouTube. It's Patrick Boyle. Some really awesome and unique videos, I think, in the finance space. Uh, and I believe you can also find him at Patrick E. Boyle on Twitter. Is there anything else you have uh, that you'd like to shout out in terms of socials? Not really. They're, that's kind of my two main social medias, Twitter and uh, and YouTube. Yeah, and, and you post fairly frequently. I believe you post at least once a week. Yeah, I kind of do a weekly video on YouTube. That's sort of my goal. Then. So if you want something more than uh, <laughs> what we, we post once every two weeks on here, hope, hoping to do more, but uh, certainly some, some great content over on Patrick's channel. So make sure to check him out. Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining us today for our first podcast or something. I'll, I'll think of a more creative name by the time I post this video, but uh, thank you, Patrick. And thank you guys for watching today. Cheers.